Meeting to order at 7.04. Uh, the public may address the board. I don't see anyone here in person. Is anyone online? Yeah, there's more people. There's more people in attendance, but yes. No one's raised their hand. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to move on to principal's report. Excellent. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you all in person this evening. <laughs> As we all get used to you know, redoing the mask mandate here in Hanover, it's still good to see your smiling eyes. So I'll go through a lot of exciting things that happened over the summer and that we're heading into for the school year. And at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to start with an enrollment update for this evening. Believe it or not, this is a big wowzers. We have 492 students currently registered, which represents more than 30 students above what we projected for enrollment for this year. I'm going to give you the breakdown next. In kindergarten, we have 83 students, and we're going to have five sections, which gives us 16 or 17 students per class. I'm going to update you on the teachers who are going to be teaching each grade. We'll have Connolly, Landry, Wilson, Hotbeck and Atherley teaching kindergarten in this upcoming year. In first grade, we have 80 students across five sections, which is 16 per classroom. And the teachers will be Temple, Butters, Phillips Whitehair, Ecker, and Orlin. In grade two, we have 73 students registered with four sections, which is 18 or 19 students per class. And our teachers will be Young, Whaley, Vashel, and Richardson. In third grade, we have 76 students, four sections, 19 students per class, and our teachers are Crawford, Waterhouse, Hunt, and Bish. In fourth grade, we have 86 students across four sections, which will be 21 or 22 students per class. Our four teachers will be Clarkson, Monmany, Hendrickson, and Scribner. And in fifth grade, 94 students across five sections, which is 18 or 19 students per class, and our teachers are Roy, Waxman, Clifford, Harold, and Stone. Uh, around placement and beginning of your information, we've been working diligently to receive and place all incoming students while maintaining balanced classes created by Ray staff back in the spring. Parents should expect to receive information about placement and other important items by the end of the day on Monday, two weeks before the start of school. <clears throat> this will include the Ray School Pandemic Response Handbook, which takes the SAU 70 framework and details the nuances about protocols and guidelines that will impact our specific school and elementary population. I'm excited to let you know that we are finally able to hold our responsive classroom trainings, and this is three years in the making thanks to the pandemic. We committed to doing this in person, which hasn't been an option over the past couple of years. So we're excited uh, to be hosting the four-day elementary core course at the Ray School, August 16th through the 19th. And we're also hosting a one-day support staff working together course at the Ray School on August 17th. With common language, routines, expectations, and procedures across Ray staff, we will continue to work together to meet the needs of all of our students. We're grateful for the support of the Friends of Hanover Norwich Schools, uh, for their generous support of this effort supplemented by other state grant funding. An update about staffing now. We want to give farewell and best wishes to some of our staff members that since the end of last year have decided to pursue different journeys and adventures. So here are a few more folks that we extend our gratitude to for their time and service at Ray as they move on to their next journey. This includes Angelina Slack, Chris Ann Hoyt, and Rosemary Ayers, three of our lovely and amazing educational assistants. Each of these people has brought, have brought their skills and gifts to the race school, benefiting students and colleagues, and we will miss them. Uh, hiring and welcoming, welcoming of new staff, we're fortunate to have hired some amazing talent heading into this 21-22 school year. So welcome to our newest hires. Uh, educational assistants, Sarah Amon, Rebecca Patel, and Fabiola Hammond. And then just because we're public now, and hopefully a lot of people are watching, we still have many open positions and we would love to get your interest and your applications. Please feel free to contact me with any questions at all. We are still looking for a part-time Spanish teacher to work three days a week, five hours each day. Several one-to-ones to support our students, including some of our preschool students. Classroom educational assistants to work with our teachers and students here at Ray. 
and a digital learning specialist, which was a, the renamed technology position to align with the certification at the New Hampshire DOE. We call it the digital learning specialist. So if you have interest or skills in any of these positions or like to learn more about it, even you all, please reach out. <laughs> please reach out and let me know. Um, as I pointed out earlier, you can see up here we have fabulous new carpet in the music room risers. And much of the building has been painted and touched up by Amy Murphy, one of our educational assistants, who was hired with a painting crew to do some painting around the school. There have been tons of other projects happening around the building, and all of those occurring parallel to Hanover camps that were housed at Ray this summer, quite a feat. Our custodial crew is working so hard to clean all of the rooms and spaces that were used by camp and to prepare for continued reopening. And so I just want to extend my gratitude to the office staff who's been working all summer, to our custodial staff for getting so much done in a limited time, uh, to the SAU for continued support as we reopen our schools again this spring, and to the buildings and grounds folks for scheduling a bunch of projects to keep our building in great shape. That concludes my report. Thank you, Lauren. So I know you can't predict this, but are you anticipating additional students between now and the start? Is what's historically what happens is gain a couple more? Yes, well, we may gain a couple more, but not a significant amount. Typically um, towards the end of July and early August, people have made some housing decisions. Um, so we don't anticipate a huge additional uptick at this point, but who knows? And at what point for the fourth grade is a decision going to have to be made? So right now you're saying it's 21 to 22 students? Yes, 21 to 22 students. Um, I haven't brought this before you because at this point, this is within the guidelines. If we were to receive like six to eight more students, we'd be pushing the upper end of the guidelines for grades three through five okay. set forth in our, in our um, policies. So I would approach you again at that point. Great. Anyone else have any? Two questions. Two questions. Yes. One, um, I read online somewhere that kindergartners had sort of pulled out of public education last year and rose to get the pandemic. So I'm wondering if there was an influx more than we expect normally with our first graders, or if we saw any of that, or where where the sort of extra 30 are coming yes. in, or if it's all over. Sure. So uh, I guess when we spoke in the spring, and I was thinking we were thinking about the different numbers of sections, we were actually predicting the kindergarten would have four sections, and we have five sections. Mm -hmm. um, we thought that second grade was going to have five sections, and they have four sections. And we thought that fifth grade was going to have four sections, and they have five sections. So we saw a lot of students across all the grades, um, but the significant ones that were unanticipated were kindergarten and fifth grade. We actually had to add sections there and remove sections from other grades to accommodate that um, for the numbers. Um, I didn't hear a lot of stories like this, but I know that we have some kindergarten students um, who elected to do kindergarten having had um, a year away in either homeschooling or just not participating in a schooling program last year for kindergarten. So they're joining us this year, which I think represents some of the larger kindergarten size that we're seeing. Gotcha. And then my second question, and full disclosure, I have a fourth grader, but I think that class, and Lauren's laughing because she knows what I'm going to say, I think that class has always been sort of on the tipping point. And we've had other classes through the years that have gone through and been like right on that line where we're always mm -hmm. saying, do we do 16, 17, or do we do 21, 22? Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just wondering if we're tracking that over time to make sure it's not the same kids year after year who have the larger classes every single time as they go through. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, but I think that's a good point, and um, we can certainly track those. Um, I know that last year in person, those classes weren't as large because some of the third grade students had elected to do remote learning, and now they're in fourth grade. We did have sort of an influx mm -hmm. back of students, um, but we'll certainly keep an eye on it, and especially as that crew has into fifth grade, and as things recalibrate with um, sort of the pandemic response at this point. Mm -hmm. So the other question regarding the kindergartners. So mm -hmm. as you said, there's potentially a large group that is a, basically a year older than normal kindergartners. So I assume there's, I, mm -hmm. my kids are 18 and 22, so I can't remember, but emotionally, physically, mentally, they're one year advanced than most kindergartners. Is there any anticipated concerns about that? 
Great question. Um, so for all, for those kindergartners where that story was the case, um, we spoke to all of those families um, to determine sort of age wise, are they just going to be older? Like if they had entered a year ago, were they going to be on the younger side and now they're going to be on the older side? Um, we had lots of great conversations about whether kindergarten or first grade was the best placement. So we do have kids that we said, okay, we understand kindergarten might be where your head's at, but let's talk about what we can do for first grade, considering you know, the development of your child. Okay. Um, so I do feel confident in what we're going to receive for K. We're not going to have a large age range. We're going to have some of the usual younger Ks and older Ks that we would typically see. Yeah. Yeah. Any pushback from parents for only offering a remote option? I've heard from only one family so far. Um, just a respectful question about whether or not we are going to consider offering it. Um, but other than that, no, I have not received any pushback. Okay. And, uh, following up on Rick's first question, is it, so is there going to be parsing out of like the younger <clears throat> kindergartners in one class, like older kindergartners in another class, or not really? No, nope, that's not something something that we would typically do. Um, typically, we receive students, and uh, just because chronologically they're a certain age, that doesn't mean that their profile is is a certain way or set in stone. Um, one great book that actually responsive classroom relies heavily on is something called Yardsticks. And within a grade, they'll give um, sort of student general student profiles and development. Um, for three different ages. So for instance, for kindergarten, they would give an age profile for somebody who's on the younger side of five, even four-year-olds, because they have to consider that, five-year-olds and six-year-olds. So we will be looking at the developmental needs. We don't typically have the older group versus the younger group. Um, and we meet kids where they are in kindergarten. Any other questions? Great. Okay. Yeah, it's not a question. I'm just looking at some actual numbers on um, attendance or, you know, um, yeah. So historic, I mean, we had kindies as high as 75. Um, and actually, we're back up to where our actuals were for 1920. We were at 491. So that's, you know, that's great news that we back to that kind of pulled the folks back in. Um, so that's it's interesting, but yeah, we've had kindies as high as 75. Uh, not often, but on occasion, with part of the level class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Thank you, Laura. Okay. At this point, we're going to move on to business requiring discussion. Uh, draft 22 23 budget guidelines, timeline, and equipment. Correct. Yep. The um, draft meeting timeline is also posted there. Uh, it has been sent. It was sent out, I think, right around August 5th for everybody to please take a look at and get it on your calendars, especially if you're involved in any of the uh, budget building meetings or if you just want to come and, you know, view them or participate, you know, bring the information. Um, we welcome all, all folks. Uh, they're open to the public. And our first one actually will be the kickoff meeting scheduled for Tuesday, August 17th from 11 to 12. Um, I did have a chance to get the quick model done today. Um, keeping in mind um, that we are entering into um, negotiations for both our teachers union and our support staff union and between those two unions they probably make up 90 i'd say 92 percent of all your staff here at the school um, so what i did do is go through the current census that we used to build this year which we know there's been a lot of changes to we'll update that between now and the october bill um, but we historically use the same census that we use to build the current school year we're in. But I did go through and I counted how many steps were going, you know, how many folks had steps available to them, and at least put that dollar amount in so we could get a rough idea of if there's nothing added to scale and we don't know where it's going to shake out. But steps based on what the average step cost is right now have been uh, added into those lines. Uh, that's why the notes says projected steps only. Um, that being said, steps are not guaranteed in New Hampshire. We have to have a tentative agreement ratified to go on a warrant. 
uh, by the third, I think it's the third Thursday in January. So, but I did include those just to be given an idea of if that did go through like that, what it would look like. We've also included a 5% increase for insurance uh, based on what the insurance elections were on the prior uh, census. Um, we also, and actually it should say the 21-22 census, sorry, not the 2021. Um, no, no, that's right, because we built 21-22 to 2021. Um, I'm in three years right now, sorry. <laughs> then we've uh, taken the CPI at July 21, which is actually running quite high, higher than it has in, in many years, at 4.3% uh, and driven that in under uh, all other programming costs uh, to just, you know, put something in there. Um, and also, let's see, I'm just going down through here. Um, with So if you look at the midway point, the total K-5 operating budget, which makes up 81% of the total high school budget, uh, with the tuition costs removed, so we can compare apples to apples this year, um, we would be up about two and a half percent based on what's been projected on the quick model. Um, and then if you add in all the expenditures that are not direct to the K-5 operating budget, uh, the SAU expenses we've um, budgeted flat, the special ed out of district tuition, you see a big jump there, and that's actually projected right now based on actual for this year. We're trending over budget coming into 21-22. We're up $150,000 over what was budgeted. Uh, we'll bring you a report on that at the next meeting. Um, the regular ed transportation, that's a projection because this year we got an extension on our contract that year we're in. And then we really need to go up to bid for the next year. Okay. Um, capital expenses, we um, I put that in with the same projection status quo like this year. Um, you know, depending on once we reevaluate where we are, that could absolutely be adjusted. Uh, debt service, that's actual, and then the interfund transactions, you make that decision as you go along. So at the end of the day, with everything in. Um, we would look at a three based on this build. It's a first draft, a 3.28 percent increase. Keep in mind the sixth grade tuition costs have been carved out of that number. Okay, so we can look at it apples to apples. Um, those expenditures for the Hanover taxpayers uh, will be uh, seen in the Dresden budget. Uh, with the revenue, there will be a revenue offset. So if we were to project it based on CPI, it would be higher at 4.2%. Uh, so why, it, yeah, why some of the CPIs are 4.2 and some of them are 4.3? Oh, I'm sorry, because I changed one and I changed the other. 4.3 is the New England, uh, is the Northeast Regional, and 4.2 is actually New England only. Because Northeast Regional takes in Mid Atlantic and New England. And so it skews it a little bit. Sometimes it skews it a lot. This way it skews it a little. So there's a tenth of a difference. I'm sorry. I thought I changed it in the top one, which would then run through the whole formula. All yeah, it, 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 bumps, it bumps back and forth between four and three and four. Yeah, three it, three. if I had changed the top one, Rick, under the regular ed, it would have yeah. driven through the whole thing. I changed the wrong one. So. Okay. Um, my, my mistake. I so we're actually this. going to be slightly less. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Okay. So I can fix that and, and then repost it for the next one. But it gives you a quick idea. It's a quick model. Again, I'm going to say, as I did in the prior year, this is going to show higher than where we'll probably actually come out. It's specifically on salaries because there's been a lot of turnover since last year. A lot, a lot of turnover. Okay. Okay, and most all the new hires that Lauren and her team have done um, are, are trending lower in salary costs. Is this assuming that all the open positions will have people were hired for? Or is this assuming as of today? No, it assumes all positions okay. will be filled. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe someone on Zoom. 
With that? We got one on Zoom. You have a question on Zoom? Yeah, we got a hand raised. Oh, um, you want yeah, go ahead and you can let them ask. Okay. Yeah, they're still muted though. Hi, you're in the room. If you could unmute, identify who you are and what which town you live in. Yeah. Okay. She her hands so she doesn't want to talk or <laughs> Okay. All right. I've done that many a time. <laughs> Any other questions for Jamie? So for the Hanover School Board, I'm on it. Kim's on it. That's it for Hanover. Yeah. Oh, so yes. It's a schedule question. I I've been trying to I live by my Google Calendar and it's not currently posted. Um, so can you just repeat the times that Hanover is at 11? It's not posted. It's not, well, it's not up there right now. I don't, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, Tuesday the 17th at 11. Dresden's at 10. At 10. Okay. Dresden's at 10 and then Hanover's at 11 right now. Yeah, it's just not, it's on our internal, uh, doc, uh, the budget oh, documents. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think it's on the calendar yet. I think Ryan was waiting for us to approve, or myself or Kim, to approve the agenda. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to move on to business requiring action. We're going to approve expenditures, the minutes from June 9th, July 21st, non public minutes, and the acceptance of Brittany James's uh, Joyce. Joyce's um, <laughs> resignation. <laughs> James Joyce. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have I have famous novels on my mind. Um, so, if someone would like to make a motion by consent, then move to approve items B through F by consent. No second. Kelly, but I do have a comment too. I, I think I need to be added to the minutes for June 9th. Not that I care, but since I'm listed as saying many things. <laughs> and not voting because I've been had to leave. I think I'm technically supposed to be in the attendees. Okay. Minor detail. So, um, based on that, uh, as amended, yeah, yes. Should I say that again? Yes. Approval. Move to approve items B through F as amended by consent. Second, Kelly, and uh, Hanzo. Yeah, <laughs> At this point, a uh, report of the chair. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Brittany stepped down. She and her family are moving to DC, and uh, we're going to miss having her on the board. We did uh, put an ad in the Valley News last Friday uh, uh, asking people to. Uh, volunteer to serve on the board. They have until the, I believe it's the 20th or the 24th to email me their uh, statement on why they want to serve on the board. We will then uh, have anyone that's uh, nominated themselves to come in in September at the Hanover School Board to be uh, met, to meet the board, answer any questions, and then we will select who will serve on the board at that point. Brittany, uh, served as our secretary for the Dresden board, secretary of the SAU board. She was our SAU policy committee. She was on it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the central staff development committee and the NHS BA liaison. So none of those really are Hanover positions. So I think the NHS BA is. Is that the Hanover? Yeah. Okay. And if everyone's comfortable with that, I can continue. Thank you. I did submit our resolution just before the deadline. Right. I remember, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Great. So, Kelly, thank you for volunteering. And then uh, I believe at the SAU and Dresden meetings, they will uh, probably assign the new member for their position. <clears throat> 
that is all I have to report tonight. Uh, our next meeting will be September 15th. And I'm going to turn it over to Robin. Sorry, I, I just was looking on the website. I think it'd be if we can mm -hmm. post. Yes, uh, I was just thinking the same thing. I'll send an email right now. Okay, awesome. Post the announcement because okay. some people don't see the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and if communications are going out, prisoners and that goes on a paper for the start of the year, but if it is doable to include it in a rate of return or something, that would be awesome. Great. Thank you. Let me I'll look at the ad that we posted just to see what the actual date is. And this is only in the, in the physical paper. It was in the Valley News. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it went out on any social media. Um, April, I mean, August 21st to submit any interest in serving as uh, just send an email of your statement to me as the chair. <clears throat> okay, Robin. Okay, so last night I presented the information from the pandemic response committee about our reopening and um, I uploaded the framework document for you. And I thought, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those after the presentation last night. If you need more information or more details, I'm happy to answer that. So how often does your team meet? Is it now as we're getting closer to the start of the school year, you're going to have? We have more meetings. We have a meeting next week on Tuesday. We have a meeting on the 7th to talk about you know, how the first week of reopening has been. And then I scheduled monthly meetings, but we've said on an as needed basis this year. We had meetings last year every week, almost. Um, so we're going to see if we can cut back a little bit, but I think probably more frequently in the beginning. And then as things change. <laughs> so are you, you know, everyone's watching the news and what's going on in other states. Is there any sense that we're going to have any direction from the state? They are really leaving it up to the schools. Okay. You know, we've gotten guidance from the CDC, which has been good. The, um, you know, the pediatric board has given guidance. There's been a lot of nationwide guidance that's been really quite good, but the state has basically left it up to the schools. And if you've been seeing in the newspaper, every district is choosing different options. Mm -hmm. You know, some are going with masks optional, some are mandating masks like we are you know, for certain periods of time. So it's really all over the place. But I think, you know, we should just stick to the guidance that we used last year and look at the rates around us. And now with the added vaccination piece, we can continue to look at that. And hopefully that will help guide our decision-making throughout the year. Great. Really? So since it's a, diff a slightly different audience tonight, even looking into your crystal ball, do you think it's safe for parents who might be worried or watching and, and wondering, safe to assume that very likely the race school will remain masked for much longer than the first two weeks. Yeah, okay. for sure. I mean, without one of the criteria that we put in is the 80% vaccination rate, and that will definitely not be available right. for either of the elementary schools anytime in the near future. I mean, we don't even have an estimated date for when the vaccines wouldn't be approved for children 12 and under. Originally, they were saying by the fall, but that has, you know, come and gone really. So, and there's not been a lot of discussion about it at this point, how soon it will actually happen. So, I don't really see it happening too soon in the near future. And if we continue with mass mandate in Hanover, it's going to take us a while, even in the other schools, to consider that too. So, I think it's just good practice for us to follow the town ordinances because, you know, we don't necessarily have to, but I feel like if people are expected to do these things everywhere else, it makes sense that we would follow the same guidance. Laura, 
Are you guys resurrecting the space theme this year, or is there going to be <laughs> something new, new and surprising? Um, I'm gonna give it a surprise. The okay. space theme is gone. We're done with the space theme, um, but uh, it's yet to be told. We will awesome. see what comes out on our first two in service days. <laughs> Looking forward to it. I'm sort of surprised that we are not going to notify families if there's a COVID case in the school. We decided not to because last year, really, we had so few cases and with no contact tracing this year, it's such a different situation. So we said we would notify families if there are clusters of cases. So for our audience, can you give a technical definition of what a cluster is? So a cluster would be two or more cases in a, a certain area of the school. So, I mean, it's... I would just worry about the lag time. Like, yeah, there were a yeah. few cases last year, but the parents knew there were a few cases, and mm -hmm. now it's up to the parents' imaginations. I can see there being some pushback there. Yeah. And, you know, if we get the feedback that parents really want to hear, that's, a, that's something we can change because we did talk about that in our meeting and we <coughs> had an experience about it. Whether there's a feedback we should continue with it or whether we should not. Mm -hmm. You know, is it worrisome when people hear that? Is it not? Unfortunately, last year we did not have a lot of cases, and I think hopefully that will continue into this year. We've seen that the masking works, so that was one of the pieces that we felt like maybe we don't need that extra layer in at this point. I would just be concerned that last year those schools up front with cases, and if they're not, then the social media and family news and COVID counts by the mm -hmm. town will fuel discussions of that yes. if the school's not saying anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's. That's a good point. Well, certainly let us know, you know, if that's what you're hearing from other members of the community, if they would prefer that, it's easy enough for us to change and do. So, thank you. Well, one thing that I really appreciated in our meeting is that um, we several times returned to the, when we started to feel emotional too, we returned to science is what got us through last year and following state and CDC guidelines is really what got us through last year, even when things felt really emotional. Um, and so this isn't just a, like a handover or SAE 70 recommendation. We're taking it from the CDC, but like Robin said, with a lot of, a lot of debate and thinking, but going back to what we know, what the science shows, and it was that if schools are safe places, there weren't lots of transmission happening inside the schools. Um, and, transition for us, yeah. For, yeah, sorry, more uh, globally yeah, yeah. Um, here in the United States. And so um, we put this in place because it was part of what the CDC recommendations were, but this is, you know, it always has been an ever evolving um, process as we see children <clears throat> still safely. So what would happen in the scenario where a group of unvaccinated kids, there's a confirmed case in the, in the room so is there is there remote learning? Is it shut down entirely? Is it as is unless there's a second case? So there won't be any, there will be no contact tracing within the schools. It will basically be if we find out there's a confirmed case in the school, now it's moved to um, the home, really. That's the place where the quarantine <clears throat> will take place. So regardless of vaccination status, anyone that is living within the home of that child or staff member would have to quarantine for 10 days in New Hampshire and 14 in Vermont. Um, there's not an expectation that if we have a case in the school that we would go to the means that we did last year, like trying to determine how many students came within three to six feet of that child for 15 minutes or more. Um, because what they found in the research across the country is that there was not there was not a significant amount of in-school transmission when students were wearing masks. And so that's why they're removing that piece of the um, of the contact tracing within the schools and the lack of quarantining because they people felt like it was just more disruptive to the schools than necessary. You know, when you think about the few cases that we had in the high school, we had significant numbers of students that we ended up removing. It wasn't as significant at the elementary schools because generally the kids were cohorted in their single class. So, but still, those all of those kids would be removed in some cases from that classroom for a significant period of time. So the research is showing us now that that probably was not necessary at the time. And so that's why there's a move away from the contact tracing within schools that are fully masked. So 
if that makes sense. I just want to confirm one thing you, you just said. I want to make sure I understand it correctly. You said that if there's a case of a child who has it, that that family, including siblings, have, have to quarantine and not go to school. Yeah. That's different than last year, right? Last year, yes. siblings could go. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So, yes. The, the situation now, though, is because they're considered close contact, very close contacts living within the same household. So, those um, individuals would have to do quarantining. So I think they do. They're on well, last year, we were told that if this, if the if a sibling did not have it, they could continue going to school. I, I could be wrong, but I think <coughs> if, if, if someone in the household had tested positive, the household had to quarantine. If someone in the household was asked to close contact quarantine, the siblings did not have to close contact quarantine. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I, I think, that yeah, I think that's what it was. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Robin. Any other You're welcome. And always, if you have any questions or concerns about anything, feel free to contact me. We're always thinking about different pieces that come up at each of our meetings. You know, we'll, some will say, oh, what about this? We didn't think about you know, this piece. So if you think of things, I'm happy to bring them to the committee. Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, as we went over yesterday, I uh, just want to update uh, our, our school community on what's happening district wide. Uh, this is crunch time. We have our custodial and maintenance staff. As you can see, we look around, getting everything shined up and, and uh, in good working order, getting our classrooms set up. And uh, we have we're in the middle of our, our big IT project right now. So there's a lot of wiring going on. We, we do have a supply chain delay that's like holding up some of that work, but we're gonna keep on pushing and getting all that work done as well. Um, HR is scrambling uh, along with Lauren and our hiring committees to, to get all of our position staff. And that'll have, that, that looks like it's gonna probably continue right up until the start of school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Jane will do, be doing her report soon, but her her, her end of the of the SAU is incredibly busy. Jamie, in particular, with transportation as well as getting ready for our next budget cycle, which we're already in. And um, so, um, so plenty plenty going on right now as we enjoy the last couple of weeks of, of summer before school starts. We do have some major initiatives that we're undertaking this year. Um, we, we are resuming the strategic planning process and we'll be discussing that as a leadership team. We have uh, the, the four chairs have met a couple of times um, to, to organize that work and we'll be appealing to board members to work on different subcommittees in the very short term. In fact, uh, if Ryan didn't email people today, she will be in probably the next couple of days. Um, another big thing that came out of our last negotiation session was that we we just we, we agreed with the HEA to um, review our evaluation of supervision model. So that work is 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 really in draft form. Right now, we're pending uh, a couple of things. We need to make a formal recommendation to both the boards and the HEA, and we'll be working on. Again, assuming that the, that the boards and the HEA approve the plan that we put together, we'll have to plan implementation. And so we know there's a, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of professional development required. So we plan on doing sort of a pilot this year um, with some, some volunteers who will, who will work within that system. We're also looking at changing the percentages of the teachers that we're evaluating in any given year on, on a rotating cycle. That part of what we can do with the existing um, model that we're using, but that's going to set the stage for some important professional development. So we're, we we have agreed to adopt the uh, Charlotte Danielson model. It's a framework for teaching that's widely used throughout the country, uh, and that would replace our SAU uh, standards of best practice that are currently undergirding most of our work that we do in PD and, and supervision evaluation. That's going to require some training. And so we'll be looking, um, working with the leadership team to figure out how we can do that in a phased way and not impose too much on, uh, on time that, that we need for other training as well. But if we do that through the course of the year, uh, we have a model already tested at the at, at Marion Cross who adopted the Denison model as well. Uh, and they actually were the partner with a really uh, outstanding trainer from Vermont NEA, who's also a part of the Danielson group. And 
she's informed us that there's a New Hampshire counterpart to the New Hampshire NEA. And so being able to, to tap into that uh, high quality professional development, um, I think will we'll go a long way to, to gaining trust among the teachers as well, because it's coming really from the teachers association. Um, so th those are some of the really big things that are happening. The, the nice thing about the Danielson model and the training the NEA is doing is it's, it's, uh, it's grounded in equity. Um, and so one of the things that came out in our discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion this past year is that um, making sure we have a rigorous and um, you know, a, a really strong curriculum that's well documented, consistent, is, is essentially a, it's, it's a prerequisite if we're going to talk about equity. And it also sets the stage for curriculum review that we'll be doing. And um, so we were really pleased to see that that was the focus of the, the model that they're, that they're espousing. So um, stay tuned, we'll be reporting out on this as, as this work evolves and we'll be seeking input from the board and from the community as we dig into the strategic planning effort that's really, um, that this will wrap into. And that's my report. Okay, any comments, questions? <clears throat> Yeah. So I won't be reporting on financials because we actually did that at the last uh, special Hanover board meeting that we called it pretty in depth. So if anybody wants to see where the projection, the updated projection of where we're going to land for 2021, they should go to the uh, prior meeting and everything is posted there. Um, building projects. Um, we still have a few larger ones here at the race school that are in process, uh, specifically the largest one that we decided to include last year was uh, the front entryway. Uh, we've been talking to um, a couple of architects because that will require architectural design to be stamped um, in order to embark on that. So we're trying to set up uh, follow up meetings with them and Lauren and her team. So we can come up with a really good design and we'll probably break ground on that I would assume fine and spring. Um, we have secured all of the new door locks for the um, safety door locks and they are in. They're going to start installing them. That will be a process that will take a little while. Um, but they're great uh, locks that are very easy for very young children to enact. Um, in case of an emergency situation, uh, we got a really good price on them, um, and we got them for all doors, all interior doors in the um, We also have, let's see, going on, still some more flooring going in, um, and that will probably happen. It, it won't all get done before the opening of school, and so some of it will probably get um, um, scheduled during December break and again during uh, February and April breaks. But we have the money available in the budget to do this. Um, let's see what else is going on here at Ray. Oh, the garden. So I think that they have been working on the garden with Nan uh, Parsons uh, out back. So that will be exciting. I know Tony's been talking to folks. So we just need a, a little bit more direction on what's necessary to get that up and running. Um, transportation update. Uh, I sent the survey out in two days late and I'll have it out by Monday, but that's okay. Um, the transportation survey went out today. I tried to grab all parents. <laughs> I may not have done it properly with uh, the messenger and most of the IT tech teams are super busy, so I tried to do it on my own. Um, <clears throat> if you did not receive an email from me <laughs> regarding signing up for transportation bus service, you can go to the district website at www.sau70.org, go to the department's transportation tab, and there's a link there that will take you to the survey. I try to make it as easy as possible this year so that everybody can report all their children on one survey. Um, it doesn't have to be an absolute, you're gonna ride every single day or whatever. You can just tell me the information that you have. Anything will help um, help us determine that we have enough capacity on our buses to pick everybody up and go to school on time. Um, 
We will be requiring masks on buses this year. It's part of the national protocol as well as protocol, you know, best practice. Um, we will not have bus monitors on board. There will be aids on board of some of the buses as there has been in the past. Um, we, let's see, we will not be taking temperatures at the door. We would ask folks to, you know, self-monitor before they go out to the bus stops. Um, and if anybody has any other questions, I'd say, you know, start by either emailing me or go to the link at the top of our webpage. It's an info link and you can send any questions in there and then it's routed by our um, communication specialist, Karen. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Food service, I think we should be good to go here at the race school. Uh, no changes that I know of in personnel at this point. Um, what else is going on? Let's see, food, transportation, maintenance, custodial. I think that's it, finance, but that's kind of boring. But so we said, talked about budget and we're kicking it off. Uh, we're knee deep in the new one and we're wrapping up the old one and mm -hmm. we're starting the next one. Any um, questions? Come on. I have a question. So the, I know where you asked this. So the technology initiative, I assume we're not carrying wiring and stuff. So it's not disruptive to the schools, right? It's, it's more of the servers and the... No, it's wiring. It's all the cabling. So when do we anticipate it being complete? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. That would be Josh Malloy. Okay. Or tech yeah, Josh has a... That right now has a uh, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things we're having problems right now is that we're, we're, there are certain components that the people that are doing the install need that are back ordered or can't. Yeah. They can't get for your cars either, right? right. right. Mm -hmm. And so the ships and everything. So, right. so this will be an ongoing all through the academic year. And we're going to defer to Lauren. Sure. So I spoke to Josh yesterday yeah. um, about the project and they're working really hard up at the middle school and, like I said, there's been. An issue with just getting supplies in. So when they're finishing up, about to be done at the middle school, they're going to reach out to me, and we're going to see how close and tight we are to the beginning of the school year. If we think that we can get it done before this we have to open up the school, then we'll do it. Otherwise, we're going to create a schedule once the school year starts where things aren't happening when students are in the building. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I kind of jumped in here. Any other comments, questions? Kelly? The question is probably for future meeting, but I'm curious about some of the. <coughs> Urban projects that are sort of, I think, in the hopper cell. I just happen to be out on the basketball courts. And I, know, I don't know if the new, I think we had new hoops coming there, right? But then we got, maybe we didn't. That, been, that was previous year. The previous year. Adjust, yes. The adjustable hoops. But we, so, yeah, those are, those are done. The hoops yeah. are done. The goals are done. Okay. Um, the Bridgman project that we had outside was uh, by our PE teachers. Who wanted to do some so stenciling and yeah, yeah and add some additional games on the green top area as well as along the sidewalks. Um, and that is up to them to do. So I've been in touch with them over the <laughs> summer to see when they would like to um, get started on that. Okay. <laughs> That's there's I just happened to see there are so many cracks in mm -hmm. that green top, which I mean with our weather, I don't I certainly don't have the material solution for that. But. No, we, and do, those, we do a ceiling, a sealant on it and a maintenance on it. It's a scheduled I mm -hmm. think every two years. Mm -hmm. Um so it's either on the schedule now or would be for spring. I don't know if I didn't bring my notes on it. The question that we wouldn't want them stenciling until the that's one of the sure. holdups we have right now is understanding what that schedule looks like so we don't get things on the ground that then and I know Tony was actually um, reaching out to the companies that it's kind of a process, right? So here's the process. Mm -hmm. He was reaching out to the companies who do the installation of that product because it's a specific and special product uh, to see what the cost would be to replace it, to get out and replace it with new. Um, if we are going to do that, we would want to do it when we do the rest of the projects of the same type of uh, aggregate material. Uh, and that would probably um, um, run into a Dresden project as well. So that's part of the not wanting to embark on replacing this one before we do the larger projects with the sister district. Because you get better pricing the more that you you know order and lay. Um, 
So that's why we've been repairing it instead of tearing it up and replacing it. Okay. But I, I mentioned and I talked to him I'll get back to you because I did ask him about it. Okay. The last time we met, I can't remember what he told me. Moving on to committee reports. I don't think we have any committees going this summer, so that's good. So at this point, we have two items to discuss in non-public. So someone would like to make a motion. Ben? Move to enter into non-public session on RSA 91A3C personnel. Second. Kelly? Kelly? McCall, yes. Johnson, yes. Johnson, yes. Yes. Okay, so this is 808. So, if someone would like to make a motion to approve uh, the items we just discussed. Marcel? Oh, move to, <laughs> I was not raising my hand. Move to approve the corrected 2021-22 nomination sheet and new hire of the LPS Learning Specialist as presented. Okay, second, Ben. All, hands. <laughs> all, all in favor, raise your hand. So I like to include everyone in my class. <laughs> I always watch for the people that don't raise their hand. Um, okay, great. So that has passed. And anyone have any agenda items for next meeting? Please let us know. And Lauren, just remind me when we have our next meeting to I'm sure we do the SAS. I will. Should we have a spot set aside for like the, uh, pending nominees to discuss themselves? Yeah, that will that will be added to the agenda. That'll be during. I guess the way we do the discussion, and then we go with the non-public and vote. Well, Correct. Do we require them just to have to be here in person? Yes. We have an address. Yes. Yeah. Okay. At this point, if someone would like to adjourn the meeting. Okay. Okay. Second. 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 <laughs> and going around the horn, Ben. Kini, yes. Johnson, yes. Kiblasia. Yes. I don't think you have to do a little talk. Thank you. But we've got it just so